I'm Tom Malaskis. I serve in the Young Life community at the Illinois Youth Center here in St. Charles. The Illinois Youth Center is one of three or four youth prisons in the state of Illinois. Kids that get convicted of crimes that are as violent as you can imagine. Young Life has been involved with the Illinois Youth Center for about 12 years, and it's mainly been one gentleman named Mike Williams. He did the ministry every week by himself. My wife and I saw this video about people that were incarcerated and how forgotten they are by society. They, some of them don't get visits, they're just, you know, sitting in jail. And we decided we wanted to do something. Some of the people in our core group found out about it and we had a meeting and we talked about, hey, is this something we want to get involved in as a core group, as the men there? So three or four times a, uh, a month on Mondays, uh, we do a Bible study and kind of a game night with, uh, with the kids there. They're just kids, they really are. I mean, they're 15, 16, 17 year old kids and I have two boys myself and you just kind of, it just breaks your heart to, to see that the environment that they've grown up in and the things that they've gone through, they, they had a, a few cards stacked against them. I think the way we bring God's justice into the IYC lessons is through Jesus' teaching, through the Bible, Bible stories about uh, things that other characters have done, good things and bad things, showing that uh, not everybody in the Bible has done all the right things. One of the kids you know, took one of the other guys that, that serve on the same team, kind of took him over in the corner, and, and they had a 20-minute conversation over in the corner, kind of by the ping pong tables, and, and he told me after that he was asking a lot of you know, deep spiritual questions. And, and that just makes you feel good, like they're listening. What I would like you to know about serving at the IYC is that it will challenge you, it will uh, potentially scare you a little bit. You'll definitely be outside your comfort zone. We have to get low, we have to get low on the ground, we have to get below Jesus and just be obedient. And, and, it's, and you're, you're just doing your job. They're listening and it's not, it's not about us. We're asked to serve. You know, we believe Jesus, he's done all this for us, and then he asks us to bring the message to other people, part of what we're doing. We're bringing the message of Jesus to kids that may or may not have heard it. I love what Tom said about it, just being obedient to the call of God and, and following Jesus where he leads. If you've been with us throughout this series and Justice for All, we've been showing you little videos to tell stories about people in our church family, in our community, doing just that. Being obedient to God and taking steps to make a difference where they can. When you look at the injustice of the world, it's, it's overwhelming and you think, what difference can I make? I'm so encouraged to hear stories from Ellie LeBron and Doug and Cheryl Kite and Tom Malowskis saying, just be obedient. Just follow where God leads and do what he asks you to do. And Tom mentioned a moment ago that he, it's bringing a message to those boys. And I'm excited to let you know someone is here to bring a message to us. So whether you're joining us online or at any of our campuses, we're glad you're with us. And I'm thrilled to introduce to you a dear friend and brother in Christ, someone who shares the call to pastor and to preach. Uh, and someone that I've gotten to know and been blessed by. His name is John Kelly. He's the pastor of Chicago West Bible Fellowship in the Austin neighborhood. You'll hear much more from him. But I feel a little bit like I get to introduce family to family. You're my church family, and this is a, a brother uh, in Christ, and so let, will you join me in welcoming Pastor John Kelly. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, hello, Chapel Street. It's really good to be with you all. I was uh, really blessed by that video. Um, that's my testimony. I spent pretty much two-thirds of my life in the criminal justice system. Um, most of my teenage years was in juvenile detention centers, and so um, I was hardly home a lot because I was always arrested as a teenager, considered a, a troubled teen, and uh, unfortunately as an adult, landed in prison on a six to 20 year sentence in which I came to faith in Christ. And so uh, I spent a lot of my time working with men and women who are still incarcerated or coming home, and to see your church rallying around that um, that is so encouraging. So good to, be, excuse me, good to be here with you all. And as your pastor said, Pastor Jeff has become a dear friend. Um, one of the blessings of 2020, and unfortunately this year has been challenging, but new friendships. And uh, we've had lunch together many times and been on the phone together and um, wept together. And I found him to be a truly a humble 
and gentle man. That, that's after my own heart. So, so good to be here with you. And I send you greetings from the rest of your family on the west side of Chicago. They all give you a hug. Um, couldn't be here together, but God willing, one day we will be here together. But uh, now if you, it's not about me. It's about God's word. And so if you have a copy of your Bible, if you could turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, we often say um, in Chicago West that cell phone Bibles is all good. If you got your iPad or a cell phone or something, if you could just uh, meet me in Matthew chapter 25. You know, as you're turning there, uh, as you're turning there, there's, there's so much debate and division, unfortunately, in our country around one word, justice. It's crazy what that means to so many different people. And uh, Christians are divided about this topic, and we shouldn't be. I know that grieves God's heart, but the question we have um, today and what I want to submit to you is what does Jesus think and what does he say about this? There's a well-known passage um, in which Jesus discusses um, the issue of justice and compassion, and it's in Matthew chapter 25 beginning in verse 31. I just want to read it together. I want to read it out loud and you can just follow along with me. I'm reading from the ESV. Matthew chapter 25 beginning in verse 31, says this. This is Jesus speaking. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd uh, separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed, By my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Verse 41, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The title of today's message is Jesus Injustice, Jesus and justice. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? God, we come before you right now, thanking you for your grace, thanking you for the cross, thanking you that we didn't get what we deserve. We thank you that you look on us as your children with tender mercies, love and compassion because of your son. God, would you teach us this morning, this evening, where we are, Lord, would you teach us what's going on in your heart, what you desire, your heartbeat? Would you protect us, Lord, for, from applying this message to other people's lives? But to think about what this means for us, to truly love you with all of our heart, but to love righteousness and to love justice in a world that is so broken, so fallen apart, so in need of grace, so in need of your love, so in need of the gospel. So Lord, we ask right now that you would make our hearts tender, you would make our hearts sensitive to your word. And it wouldn't be Pastor John, but it would be us hearing the voice of our shepherd speaking to us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's much to be covered here, to be honest. We could probably spend 10 months looking at this passage. But there's three things that we can learn about Jesus and his approach to justice. As we think about the world, all you got to do is look on your social media feed. All you got to do is turn on the news for a little bit. Maybe you don't want to look at social media anymore because it's so toxic, right, with all the arguments and the back and forth. 
But the question is, what does Jesus think about that? What does he think about how we should approach the issue of justice in this country? There's a couple things that we can learn here, three things in general about him, about God, how he sees justice himself and what he requires of us from this passage. So here's the first point if you're taking notes. The first observation we see here is this. Every soul is accountable to God. That's the first thing we find here is every soul is accountable to God. Look with me in verse 31. It says, when the Son of Man comes, this is Jesus referring to himself, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep on his right but the goats on his left right so here's the the idea here is judgment day and the reality is um, every single person on this planet every last one of your co-workers and family members every person that lives on your street on your block regardless of what they think who they vote for every person will give an account to jesus Every soul, every, 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 every tongue will confess, every knee will bow that he is Lord. Everyone will stand before him. And what we're finding here is Jesus is going and saying, let me tell you what, um, how to think about justice in light of the end. And there's going to be a day where the entire world, the nations will stand before me. The dead will be raised, some to eternal life and some to eternal judgment. And I will hold every soul accountable. That's real. Every second that goes by is another, another second closer. We don't know if that's next week, next month. And we don't know if we, when we take our last breath, that could be, I could leave here and, and be in glory before I get home. May not even make it home. Right? So the reality is every soul will stand before him. And he describes an aspect of judgment day. And the Bible has a lot to say about what that would be like. But it's interesting here the criteria that he gives for accountability. If you notice in the text here, in the passage that we read, the criteria is not, did you lie? Did you steal? Did you commit adultery or did you commit murder? The criteria here is, how did you treat people? Especially those who were in need around you. How did you treat your brother or your sister, your sibling who's an alcoholic that your family struggles with on Thanksgiving? Should Bob come over or not this year? Because everything goes south when he comes over. Or how do you treat your coworker in the next cubicle that you can't stand that irritates you? Or your son or daughter school teacher who supports the political party that you disagree with? How do you treat them? And so what we find here, what Jesus is showing us is that every person in human history will give an account for his or her use of the opportunities given to them to serve others in need. Yeah, there'll be many things that he brings up, right, uh, and many things about sin. But one thing that we see here is that he's actually holding them accountable to how they treated others. And what we find here is that how we treat others are either evidence of God's grace in us, and his work in us, or our rejection of that grace. And so there's some questions that we got to think through as we look through Matthew 25. The question we got to ask here, first of all, and I love questions because it allows us to dig deeper into the text, is why is Jesus even holding people accountable anyway? Why is he demanding anything from anyone standing in front of him? Well, one, he is God. He created us all in his image. And we are responsible to him. But there's some things about him that we can learn. I just want to give you two passages. Psalm 89, 14 says this. Psalm 89, 14 says this. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Think about that. So he's sitting on a he's sitting on a throne, and Psalmist says, righteousness and justice are the very foundation of his throne. But notice this, steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Keep that, keep that in mind about love, because you'll see this theme pick up later on. Next verse, Psalm 33, verse 5 says this about God. He loves righteousness and justice. He doesn't just like it or do it. He loves it. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth 
is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Please keep love in mind because everything God does is fueled by love. Love for his glory. Love for his creation, which he holds accountable. Think about what you just read. Righteousness and justice are at the very foundation of God's throne, and it's driven by love. And what does it mean that that God is that God's righteousness and that that God is consumed and He loves righteousness, He um, he, he loves justice, and that everything is driven by love? What does it even mean to be righteous? What does it mean that righteousness is at His throne? At the very core of it, we don't have to get deep into Greek and Hebrew, but the very essence of it when you study righteousness and what it means in Scripture is essentially to do what's right, to do what's correct in our lame terms. It's the idea of being innocent or being blameless. This is why all of us who are in Christ are righteous and blameless before God. It's the idea of doing what's right and good and just in His sight, what's pure, what's holy. So if, if righteousness is doing what's right, doing what's just, doing what's pure, doing what's holy, then justice is the act of holding unrighteous deeds accountable. To pursue justice is to demand righteousness. That's what you're doing. When you pursue justice, you say, this isn't right in any situation, right? All All acts of sin are considered unrighteous, and God holds all people accountable. He doesn't cherry-pick any topic. Every category to him is serious. He doesn't pick this category and then shortchange that category. Everything to him is is white and black, no gray area. It's either lukewarm. It's no lukewarm. It's either you hot or you cold, you in light or you in darkness. You did what's right or you did what's unjust. And he holds his creation to that standard. He holds sin accountable and he judges fairly. That's what it means that he's just. He always judges righteously. This is what the cross teaches us, brothers and sisters. This is what makes the cross so beautiful. You want to see how serious God takes justice? Look at the cross. He demands justice. That's what the cross is about. You want to see how serious he takes righteousness? Look at the cross. Yet you want to see God's love? Look at the cross. It is the most complex situation because you see mercy, grace, justice, righteousness all hugging each other. And it's it's interesting that God doesn't just demand that. He doesn't just call for that. But then he calls his people to be the same way. We reflect his image. We reflect his heart. We are his children. We are citizens of heaven. And we operate in the way that our king operates. And where our country, where, where we come from. And so we are called to live this out as God's representatives, as his ambassadors on earth all the time. Sometimes we just miss it because we just go past the scripture so quickly. I want to give you a couple of verses. 1 Timothy 6.11. 1 Timothy 6.11. But as for you, O man of God or woman of God, flee these things. That's sin. Look what's next. Pursue righteousness. Pursue it. Do what's right. Godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29 says this. If you know that he is righteous, that is God, that is Christ. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. You want to know who's a follower of Christ? They practice righteousness. Or they seek to practice righteousness. And another verse, Micah 6, 8, one of the most well-known verses that Christians love to uh, quote. He has told you, O man or woman, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What is he asking of you? After the cross, after salvation, all he's asking is, but to do justice. Do what's right. And to love kindness. Some translation says, love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And so what we find here is when we think about Jesus' foundation, it's good for us to recognize how God approaches justice because that's who we follow. And it also makes us understand the seriousness of the cross. The cross is more than something you wear around your neck. It costs something. 
significant because God doesn't play any games about righteousness, holiness, and he demands justice, even if it means sending his own son to the cross. Think about that. So those who know Christ pursue what is right, and we repent when we fall short. And this is why Jesus in this passage here refers to his followers as righteous. Look at verse 37. It says, then the righteous will answer him saying, right? So there's this idea that, that not only does God love righteousness, but he refers to his followers as the righteous, those who are righteous. So you can't just love righteousness and not love justice. And you can't love justice and not love righteousness. To seek justice is to seek righteousness, We find here that Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the unrighteous, and he holds them accountable for doing what's right. And here's the litmus test that he gives them. In all situations of life, the the, the question we have to ask ourselves in whatever situation, whether we see some injustice on the news, some injustice that has happened to us personally, something that's going on in our family, things that's going on at our job, things that's going on around us, the litmus test, the question we have to ask is, what is the right thing to do? In this situation, what is the most God-honoring thing to do in this situation? What is the most loving thing to do for my neighbor to the glory of God? And Lord, whatever that is to do, help me to do it and to not fear man. Because I find so many Christians know the right thing to do, but they're afraid of losing their friends. This is the foundation of understanding Jesus and justice. He loves righteousness and justice. That's what the cross is about. And every soul is accountable to him. That's just what the cross is about. That's what we preach when we preach the gospel, that you are accountable to God. But here's the second observation that we find from this passage. And jot this down if you're taking notes. Those who know Jesus love their, uh, love their neighbor. Let me say that again. Those who know Jesus love their their neighbor. Look with me in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you, he's referring to the righteous now, those who know him. The king will say to those who are on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous, of all the things he could have called them, the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. I was in need and you served me. Those who are righteous in Christ respond to those around them with the love of Christ. Because righteousness and justice is always fueled by love. God, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, A profound verse to think about. Matthew 22, verse 37 through 40. He says this. And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You know what's interesting about all of us in here? Not only are we brothers and sisters in Christ and we're going to be in glory together, so you're stuck with me, right? (laughs) But the amazing thing is we all have the same divine purpose. Now, how that plays out looks different. For some of you, it plays out at the police station or as a school teacher or on a hospital floor or as a pastor or as this and that. But we all, when when you strip it all down on a surface level, we all have the same purpose in Christ on this earth. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Nothing else matters more. He's the treasure of our hearts. That's the first and most important thing. And then the second, he says, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said the entire Bible can hang on these two things. That's Jesus saying that. 
He says, if you can love people the way you love yourself, you'll be okay. If you can approach people the way you would want to be approached, you'll be okay. Right? It's one of the things I'm teaching my two sons right now, right? Treat people how you want to be treated. That's how the world says it. Jesus says, he calls it loving your neighbor as yourself. So there's two questions that we got to think about then. Okay, that's, I, I get it, Lord. I get it. I get loving you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Right? That, that is the most important thing. No, God's before you, and Lord, I delight and I long for you. Help my heart to love you more than anything, more than my job, more than my bank account, more than anything this world has to offer. And all the saints would be like, ah, amen to that, right? But then, Lord, what does it mean to love my neighbor? There's, there's some questions here. Who, who is my neighbor, and what does it mean to love them? And Jesus spent a lot of time trying to teach people about who their neighbor is. Because that's where we struggle. We struggle with that question. Okay, I get it. The Pharisees knew well, okay, to love you, God, I get that. But who is my neighbor and what does it mean to love them? Let me just give you a couple examples and a couple options to think through. One, your neighbor is your friends and family. Every person that's related to you and every person that's a friend, that's your neighbor. Notice that the scripture doesn't say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor that you like as yourself. And love your neighbor that you get along with as yourself. In fact, Jesus at one point in Scripture says, what good is it if you love those who love you back and can repay those who repay you back? Even the world does that. So friends and family, neighbors. Also, those you dislike, those you don't agree with. That's what Jesus means. Whoever right now, when they come to mind, you're like, ah, they just irritate me. I don't even want to, it just ruined my day. Insert them in neighbor. And Jesus, if you think that the, the, the early Christians and the Jews got this well, they struggled. I mean, think about this. Jews hated Samaritans so much, they didn't have trains and planes. They would walk around Samaria. They'd rather walk around Samaria miles, miles by foot or on a donkey or a horse than go through Samaria. I mean, it totally puts the woman at the well story in a whole different light. I mean, Jesus, you can you imagine how people felt when he gave the Good Samaritan story? When people don't like Samaritan, I mean, it would be like going to Democrats and calling the story the Good Republican. Or going to Republicans and calling the story the Good Democrat. Like he made the person, the hero, the person they don't like. I mean, think about this. But the same goes for us. If Jesus was teaching a parable, he probably would have made the hero the person you don't like. And so our our neighbor is our friends, our family, those you dislike, but also those in need around you. It's amazing to me that Jesus spent so much time with the poor and the sick. It's amazing to me that God himself could have chosen any city or town to live in, but he chose Nazareth. So much so that when they said the Messiah has come, the first response from people was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus could have been born at the best hospital ever, and he should have been. He was born in a manger. There's something to learn from him about how he chooses to associate with the disenfranchised. Even the Pharisees was like, why are you having dinner with them? Don't you know who they are? So our neighbor is friends, family, those you dislike, basically everybody that's not you. That's what it means. And my plea to you, brothers and sisters, is don't cherry pick. Because he doesn't cherry pick. It's easier to love your best friend than it is to love your brother-in-law who had an affair on your sister. It's easier to love your next door neighbor that you get along with than your coworker who doesn't vote like you or think like you. We don't get to choose who we are called to love. We don't get to choose whose feet we get to wash. We don't get to pick that. Christians don't cherry pick. We don't choose between racism or abortion or this or that. We stand for justice, period. It doesn't matter who the skin color is what the age is, what the person is, in the womb or out of the womb. We stand for what's righteous because we're citizens of heaven. And where we come from, this is how it goes. 
And there's going to be times where it's going to be hard to fit nice and neatly into any category the world offers because we transcend it. Our Savior transcends it. It's really hard to fit nice and neat into the world's categories. Be careful of using their terms. Be careful of using their categories. We stand based upon kingdom principles. So who is my neighbor? Pretty much everyone in this world. Well, then what does it mean to love them? What does it mean to love my neighbor? What does it look like? What does love look like in action? I love the scriptures because I feel like the word of God gives the best definition of love. Outside of the cross, here's a good example of love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. This is God's definition of love. In action, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Let me back up real quick. We all, we all, we all checked out from there, right? Failed, 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 failed. Got to delete that Facebook post, gone, right? Think about this. Love is patient. Am I being patient in this situation? If I'm not, it's not loving. Love is kind. Am I being kind? Love does not envy or boast. It doesn't brag. It is not arrogant or rude. Was I rude? Did I cut this person off? It does not insist on its own way. Do I always demand things? It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. See the righteousness there? We don't celebrate any evil. We rejoice in what's true. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. How do you approach your neighbor? Being patient. Because you know how patient God has been with you. You're kind. Because our Savior is kind. You don't envy, you don't boast in anything. Paul said, I don't boast in anything but the cross. I don't boast in my resume. I don't boast in my job. I don't boast in my bank account. I know all of that belongs to the Lord. And anything I have is by his grace. Right? The famous saying, right, is Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. I'm not too arrogant and above you. If not for the grace of God, heaven is a world of everyone. Everyone in heaven, one, was Jesus' enemy first. And everybody's story is, I was but God. That's everybody's testimony. Now, how you fill in the, the, the what was I was, everybody has the same thing, but God. And I was the enemy of the cross. It's amazing to think that every single person Jesus died for was first his enemy. Think about that. And so loving your neighbor here as yourself is doing for them what you would want done for you. Think about what we read here when he says, I was thirsty, I was hungry, right? If you were hungry, you would want someone to give you food. If you were thirsty, you would want someone to give you something to drink. If you were a stranger, you would want someone to welcome you. If you were naked in need of clothing, you would want someone to clothe you. If you were sick or you had COVID, you would want someone to care for you, to help you, to take care of your family. If you were in prison, you wouldn't want to be rejected and you wouldn't want to be held by that. Simply a number or your offense, I can tell you that travels with you everywhere and even Christians treat you by what your past is. But he says, I was in prison and you visited me. Or in our terms, I was in prison, I came home and you hired me. You helped me get housing. You helped me get back on my feet. We could even add some more to this that wasn't included in there. I was full of anger and bitterness towards you and the demographic you represent, and you were patient with me. I I lashed out at you in disrespect over this past election, and you responded with gentleness and prayer. Love wants what's best for others. I often think when we look at the news and when we see all these topics going on, we're asking the wrong questions. It's not about black and white or Republican and Democrat. That's the fruit. That's the surface stuff. 
We're asking the wrong questions. The question we need to ask is, who is my neighbor and do I love them? That's how kingdom minded people think. It's not about, we don't just jump into the categories of black, black, white, Latino, Hispanic, Republican, Democrat, city, suburbs, whatever, Western, non-Western. No, no, we think of who is my neighbor and do I love them? That's what Jesus was trying to get his disciples to see. If you take on the, the categories of the rest of Israel, you'll never go to Samaria. Ever. And you'll never witness to a Roman centurion, ever, because you take on the categories of the world. But let me teach you a principle of the kingdom. Love your neighbor. Well, who is my neighbor? The Samaritan, as well as the Pharisee and the tax collector that you don't like. That's your neighbor. So when I tell you to go into the world and make disciples, Matthew 28, if I don't get this into your heart, there's places you will never go. And what grieves my heart more than anything isn't simply black or white or this and that. It's the church that we are dropping the ball. We literally won't preach the gospel to some people at all. We refuse to talk to them. That's how we approach them. I won't preach to you because you don't vote like me. And you don't look like me. And we get pulled right into the world's issues and the world's things, and we don't speak prophetically. We don't, we don't show them a different way. And God gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity with every riot and every argument and every election and every shooting. And what he shows us over and over and over and over is that we hate each other just like the world does. Jesus says, by this all men will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. And every time some racial issue or something happens in this country, you respond the same way the world does. And then you wonder why they don't want the Jesus, the gospel of Jesus that you preach to them. Why would I come to church and you act the same way I do? How are you going to teach me to love my uncle or to love this person who hurt me or to, 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 to do something different or to truly come together when the church is just as divided as the world? What, what, why would I want that? Jesus is teaching us a different way. Those who know Jesus and are righteous naturally display acts of love, compassion, and kindness to those around them. This is what Jesus is teaching us. Because look what he says in verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? The righteous, their response is, oh, when did we see you and do that to you? Because our mind wasn't, oh, we're simply doing this for Jesus. Our mind was we just did it because it's the right thing. They didn't even realize Jesus had to tell them, oh, when you were doing that, to the, when you gave that homeless man money or you loved on that person or you walked um, with your coworker through this very challenging situation and all the trauma that they went through, and I know that was draining for you, that was hard for you, but you were trying to love on them, you did that to me. But the righteous person in that moment isn't thinking that. They're just doing that because that's what kingdom citizens do. That's what Christ followers do. Here's a question. Would those who know you personally or those who have interacted with you briefly say, man, she's such a loving person? Would those who know you, and I'm talking especially your family and your coworkers, would they say, man, he's one of the most loving guys I've ever been around in my life. You can't talk to her for five minutes and not feel encouraged at all. You can't be around him for 10 minutes and not feel the love of Christ. Now, I know, saints, I know we are not perfect. I am not perfect. My son will tell you I am not perfect, right? But the reality is, are we striving for that? We don't do it to please people, but to please the Lord. We want to show people the love of Christ. And would the, the measuring stick is not, not how many people I invited to church, but how many people would vouch for my character and say she is one of the most loving people, one of the most compassionate people I've ever been around. And you know people feel that way is when unbelievers come to you for advice and counsel. Maybe even ask you for prayer. If you want to understand Jesus and justice, you must understand love. Those who know Jesus seek to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and they seek to love their neighbor as their self. But here's the last observation, the last point that we learn, 
is a contrast to that. Those who don't know Jesus ignore their neighbor. Those who don't know Jesus ignore their neighbor. Look with verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice how he refers to them. One is righteous and one is cursed. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me and you know the rest. You see the contrast here? Those who know Jesus and love him naturally serve and love others. And those who don't know him neglect others. They ignore the needs of those who are around, who are around them. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 says this, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? How do you, how do you see someone in need right there and then you, 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 you close your heart to them? Now, I want to encourage you because I have failed at this over and over and over. But when the Lord is showing us this truth, it's to sanctify us and grow us. When God shows us hard things, it's, it's, it's not to shame us. It's never to shame us. He took everything on the cross, but it's in order that we might grow, that we might see it, repent of whatever we need to, and then walk accordingly. But in 1 John, right, how, how can you have the world's good and see your brother in need or your sister in need and close your heart against them? How does God's love abide in him or her? Satan always seeks to make you self-centered because he's self-centered. That's what pride is. It's self-centered. It's self-focused. That's what the first commandment is. You shall have no other God before me. Satan said, but I want to be God. And then everything he does is try to make you the God of your life. And when you're self-centered, none of this makes sense. When you are walking in a self-centered, self-preserving way, self-focused way, all of what's being said here is a turnoff. I don't want to hear about that. I got to go. What time is it? And notice what they said. Now, Jesus, he referred to two categories, the righteous and then the cursed. That's, so that's how he talked about both of them. Sheep, righteous, goats, cursed. Going to two different things. You're going to heaven, glory that has been prepared for you. And then you're going into the eternal fire prepared for the, the devils and his, the demon, the devil and his angels. But then notice what the unrighteous refer to Jesus as, verse 44. Then they also will answer, this is those he said were cursed, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? Notice what they call Jesus. Lord, Master. This is an important observation here because what validates our witness isn't just going to church and calling Jesus Lord. Saying that you love Jesus while neglecting those around us is hypocritical and a poor witness. You could call him Lord, Lord, Lord all you want. What's going to show that you know him is your actions. That's why scripture says um, in the book of James, let's not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. Think of this. Think of this. Imagine a father or a mother, but imagine a father telling his sweet young daughter, I love you, sweetie. Daddy loves you. But never making any of her softball games. Never making any of her uh, piano recitals. Never playing with the children when around the house. Now, he can bring her to church all he wants. He can send her to youth camp all he wants. He can send her to Awana and Christian camps all he wants, but what will show her that her father loves her isn't his words or him dragging her to church, but how much time he spends with her and how much of himself he gives to her. You can say all day long, you love me, Dad, but you never made my game. And every time you come home, you don't play with me. You plop on the couch and you watch the news. You're present, but you're not present. You see how love, the actions, motivate it? Jesus didn't just preach the kingdom. He showed acts to, to go along with it. I'm healing you as a witness to the gospel. 
I am feeding you as a witness to the gospel. I am raising Lazarus from the dead. I am doing these things as a witness to the gospel. Peter, I'm healing your mother-in-law because I am compassionate and that's what you do, but also to testify to the gospel. And it validates my message because you know when I'm saying something, I actually love you because I'm willing to heal you. When people avoid the leper, I touch the leper and cleanse him or her. And so when I come to you and I say, the son of man is willing to die for you, and you say, well, how can you die for somebody like me? You know I mean it because I'm willing to touch you. And I will tell you this, nobody in Chicago at all cares about the gospel if you're not willing to touch them. People on the street who are homeless don't care about you talking about Jesus when you give them the shoulder. Moms and mothers don't care what you preach about abortion if you're not willing to talk to the young girl. When all you can do is say, we're, about, we're against abortion, which I am too as well, but you have nothing to say to the mother. Who maybe they were sexually abused and that's the reason why she's thinking about that. We have to think about these things. That as we preach the gospel, that there has to be a tangible touch that goes along with it. And when we choose not to do that, my brothers and sisters, we are in sin. Don't be known simply for inviting people to church, but let us also be known for our acts of compassion and our availability to others. James chapter 4 verse 17 says this, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. That is known as the sin of omission. This sin of commissions, this, that we, acts that we commit, but then there's a sin of omission. You know the right thing to do and you don't do it. It says here in James 4, 17, and to him or her, it is sin. You knew what to do and you walked away. God help us, God help me. So they will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And did not minister to you, then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is how we think about Jesus and justice. Every soul is accountable to God, and that should give us a sense of urgency to think that your co worker might be in God's presence. One of the things I get, I get gripped with, and the Lord brings it back to me all the time. I think of all my family members, and I mean, I never want to hear someone on the other side of glory. I'm looking away. If someone's in hell or the fire, and it's like, why didn't you tell me? You mean we talked every day, and you didn't say a word to me? And you knew I was going to end up here? Every soul is accountable to God. Let us have that in mind. This is way bigger than white, black, Republican, and Democrats. This is about souls who don't know Jesus, who are our neighbors. And those who know Jesus love their neighbors, and those who don't know him ignore their neighbors. As we close, I just want to share, I don't know if you know some of my story, but I grew up in a single-parent home in North Philadelphia. As I shared, I spent a majority of my life in and out of juvenile detention centers. The first time I ever got convicted of a crime, I was about 12, 13 of aggravated assault. When I was 12, I first started selling crack in crack houses. I felt the seventh grade. I went to four different high schools in, the, in my freshman year, and then I dropped out of high school. I was the typical angry teen from a single parent home, always getting shot at, always shooting at somebody. I never thought I lived to be 18. I had no category for ever talking to you. And unfortunately, at 19, went with a group of friends to rob the home of one of the drug dealers in our neighborhood, and one of my friends shot and killed him. And I was sitting in solitary confinement at 19 years old looking at the death penalty and life in prison. And it was my first week in prison when a, a, a guard who wasn't afraid, afraid to share his faith gave me a copy of God's word. And I began reading it, and I haven't been the same since. I thank God for that man. I never saw him again. I know I see him in glory. And he probably has no clue that a, that young man came to faith in Christ and would one day be a pastor. I would go on and I gave my life to the Lord and I would go on and be sentenced to six to 20 years for third degree murder and my role in that crime, even though I didn't shoot any, even though I didn't pull the trigger, I still was guilty. I had to ask for forgiveness from the young man's family um, who was a victim. It doesn't matter. He wasn't a drug dealer, simply a drug dealer. He was a young man created in the image of God who did not deserve to lose his life. And I have to deal with the weight of that every day. 
And when I came home from prison, I got plugged in the Christian Stronghold Baptist Church in West Philly. And the men and women there opened up their dinner table to me. Taught me so much about love and life. My wife, her mother, when I approached her mother and asked her mother, can I approach your daughter? Because that's what the men told me as I was submitting to the men. Ask her mother. Her dad's not in her life. See, see what her mother says. Would you allow some man who just came home from prison less than a year ago to date your daughter? And he was in prison for murder? Yeah, I know that he's in church and he loves the Lord, but would you, would you let him come to your dinner table? She let me come to the dinner table. And the men in the church, they said, John is always... I played at our dinner table for you. Everything I learned about being a man, everything I learned about being a husband, I didn't go to a discipleship program. I sat at someone's dinner table who opened it up to me. And here I am today. I'm a pastor, and I serve with prison fellowship doing advocacy. I get to go to the White House and Congress and constantly uh, argue for resources for young men and women. We get to work with a lot of men and women coming home on the west side. I get to be a bridge between gangs and police officers. There hasn't been a week that our church has existed that we haven't worked with the police department and we do so much together. But all that from a young man who was in a prison cell, 2002. Here's the point of what I've learned. There's no place more intimate than your dinner table. At Chicago West Bible Church, we often say that the, the greatest ministry we offer is our dinner table. I believe that the most powerful thing is the dinner table. The question I often ask myself is, who's at my dinner table? Never allow your heart to get to a place in which you refuse to open your dinner table to those who you don't like or disagree with. I know my heart is not in a place to love my neighbor when I'm unwilling to eat with them and pray with them. And I've found, brothers and sisters, the fast way to work for, fastest way to work for it is, hey, let's grab lunch together with the person you can't stand. Let us seek to love God and to love our neighbor because this is the path of, ju the path of justice. Amen? Amen? Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Lord, you commanded us to love our enemies. Pray for those who use you, despitefully, spitefully use you. Lord, we are not like you. For some of us, Lord, that is hard. That might be loving, but how does it look, how would it even look like to love the person who's deeply wounded us? God, would you forgive us for the Samarias that we have in our life? The Jews would call the Samaritans dogs. They referred to the Gentiles as dogs. And the Samaritans had a lot to say about the Jews as well. Yet one of the greatest stories in Scripture is the women at the well. Jews didn't like tax collectors because they took advantage of them. It was so unjust. Yet you saw Levi, known as Matthew, at the tax booth, and you told him to follow me. Well, we wonder what that would have done to John and James and Peter. The person who rips off our people and takes advantage of our people, that's the person you're going to make a, a disciple? Lord, we're reminded of how you washed Peter's feet knowing he would deny you and washed Judah's feet knowing he would betray you. I want to repent, Lord. We want to repent that we have failed to love as you've called us to that we've got sucked into the categories of the world and instead of speaking into them, we've picked up the rocks that they pick up and we throw them all over the place. We throw them at each other. And then we walk away and we quote verses. And we try to share the gospel with our neighbor after just attacking someone on social media. And we wonder why our kids don't want anything to do with the church. Lord, we, we, we ask for your forgiveness. But God, we're so thankful that all of this is independent upon us. And we know how the story ends. It ends with all of us together in glory. Without any sin, pure. 
white, black, Latino, Asian, those who voted Republican, those who voted Democrat. We couldn't decree on a, agree on a lot of stuff here, but God, one thing we know is we all make it home together. Would you help us to see the big picture? And would you help us to always ask who is my neighbor and how do I love them? Would you help us to examine our dinner table? God, forgive us that so often everyone who sits at our dinner table looks just like us and thinks just like us. Would you help us to diversify our dinner tables? Truly show our children and our neighbors something different? And help us not to give into the fear of man because we care what people are going to say when they see us in Samaria or what the Pharisees are going to say when they see us eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. Lord, help us to only uh, live for an audience of one, and that's you. God, I pray not simply for revival in America, but I pray for revival in your church, and it begins with our own hearts. Forgive us for always applying these sermons to other people. Help us to apply it to ourselves. And I see that you love us, you care for us. Lastly, Lord, I just pray a special blessing on Chapel Street, the saints that call this church home. Would you show your loving kindness and tenderness to every soul here? Would there be a spirit of unity and fellowship here? Would there be a spirit of breaking bread in homes and at tables here? Would there be a spirit of watching feet and loving each other in sacrificial service here at this church? Would that be the character and the culture of the people here? And would they live that way, Lord, not just together as one body in Christ, but on the streets, the blocks, the workplaces, the homes that you've called us to? Would you teach us, Lord, to love you with all our heart, mind, and soul and strength and to truly love our neighbor as ourselves? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for having me, everyone, and I pray that you were encouraged. Yeah. Let's join me in thanking Pastor John. Thank you. I, I, I've been so encouraged and challenged and convicted, I, I hardly have words, which is unusual for me. Um, but thank you, Pastor John. Thank you, wife and your sons and your church family for sharing your gifts with us. You've given us such a gift. So bless all of you for tuning in and watching with us. Join us next week as we wrap up this series. This will be a message that I know I will listen to again. I encourage you to do the same. God bless you and go in peace.